Welcome everyone to Mount Calvary Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Beechler, and we are here to gather for worship. And today's worship service has an idea that a lot of us have forgotten about. And the idea is this, Jesus is praying for us. As it says here in John chapter 17, I am praying for them. Jesus prays for us in the good times, but especially in the storms of life. And I hope as you go to today's worship service that you will understand that there is a God who is praying for you and you will see the answer to his prayers in the storms of life. Let us pray. Lord God, meet us here this day as we worship you. Let us focus upon what you have done for us and how greatly you love us. And let us see that you are the answer to your prayers for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. you now to stand for this opening part of worship. We begin this worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. 
Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my sins to God, and you will forgive my sins. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. We flee to your refuge, to your infinite mercy, and ask and implore of your mercy for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now together as a community we confess, O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of our sins, and by your Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of you, and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear now the wonderful news. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in his name, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows upon them the Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. We encourage you now to greet people online or people in the same room with you with the peace of the Lord. We have been forgiven, and so we forgive those who have wronged us as God has loved and forgiven us. Amen. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, who made forever our home, our strong deliverer, you are the Everlasting God, the everlasting God, you do not pay to hold, go weary, you're the defender of the weak, you comfort those in need, you lift us up on wings, Boys and girls, today we are going to learn about prayer, and specifically a prayer that Jesus made for us. Jesus prayed for you and me and, and all believers. He prayed for the disciples. In John chapter 17, we can find that very prayer. And this was the prayer that on the night that he was betrayed and that he was going to be arrested, he prayed. 
for the disciples and for us. Here's what he prayed for. He prayed these things for his disciples. That they would be one as he and the Father were one. That God would protect them from the evil one. That they would be made holy by the truth of God's word. The prayer that Jesus prayed for the disciples uh, was for us too. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And that's you and me. God wants us to be protected. God wants us to be holy, to be strong in our faith. And God wants us to be together as one. So I have some metal here. Metal objects to kind of represent us, believers, the church. Maybe sometimes we argue. Maybe we don't agree on things. Or maybe we're just off on our own. And we can forget that Jesus' message of love is for us to be together and to show that and tell that to others. So this magnet is going to represent Jesus. And Jesus' prayer for us that we would be protected, that we would be together as one. What do you think? That's awesome. Let's pray to God right now and thank him. Dear God, thank you for being with us. Thank you for sending us Jesus. And thank you for Jesus' prayer for us. Help us, Father, be closer to you, to be closer to each other, to share your message of, good, of the good news that Jesus has saved us from our sins. Be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah 25, 6, 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples the sheet that covers all nations, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgraces of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Our second reading is from Philippians 4, 2 through 8. Plead with Judea, and I plead with Sintich to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. The Gospel reading is from John chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. You may rise for the reading of the Gospel. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work 
that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me. They have received them and have come to know that in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Our creed today will be the Apostles' Creed. Let us begin now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. mercy and peace be from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We're on session seven of unshakable hope, building our lives on the promises of God. And today's promise is one that you probably never thought about, or if you have thought about it very rarely, but it's an amazing promise that God has given us. And to understand this promise, I want to share with you a story that took place in a small church in Kentucky back in the 1960s. Uh, this was a very tight-knit church. The families loved each other, cared for each other, and they all brought their kids to church. 
And there was one kid who just did not like church at all, who squirmed and made noises and uh, just disrupted the service quite often. And one day, the father just got fed up with his little kid. And the father picked up his son and began to carry him out of church. And he was carrying him underneath his arms. The feet were in front of him. And the kid's face was facing the congregation as he was being taken out. And as he was being let out, the child said something that made the whole church stop and smile and laugh. As the kid is being taken out, he said in a very clear voice, y'all pray for me now. And that is what our subject is about. Intercessory prayer, praying for others, but knowing that Jesus is praying for us, that Jesus is praying for you. And that's God's promise for today. Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And so our promise is that we will take heart because Jesus is speaking for us right now before our Father's throne. So let's get into today's sermon. Point number one, Jesus teaches that we will face storms in life. Jesus is not pessimistic. He is realistic. So listen to the words of Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble. Take that to heart. You're going to have troubles in this world. And often we think that we get to live in some type of bubble and that Jesus lived in some type of bubble away from the trials and troubles of this world. And Jesus himself faced all kinds of troubles. His family thought he was out of his mind. Uh, Mark 3, he's out of his mind. His closest friends deserted him at his arrest. Everyone deserted him and fled, says Mark 14. His own people rejected him. Crucify him, crucify him. Jesus had a life full of troubles. The religious leaders, the right and the left, hated Jesus and wanted him dead and worked to have him put to death. The Romans who ruled eventually had Jesus crucified. The book of Isaiah prophesied about the life of Jesus. Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus did not live in a bubble where there was no trouble. He lived in this world and he suffered in this world. And he came to redeem and purchase us back from this fallen world that we live in. And we too as followers will face storms. Philippians 1.29 for to you has been given the privilege not only of trusting him, but also of suffering for him. And a lot of Christians have this bad theology, this bad idea of what the Christian faith is about. They believe that now they belong to God, they will pass through life without troubles. They get to live in this bubble of God's protection. And that's not what Jesus told us is true. And that's not what the Bible preaches. And we see this idea that we will have trouble, we will have persecution all through the book about the history of the early church. You see, the book of Acts is about the church in the first 40 years. And the book of Acts has amazing miracles, but also shows some of the trials and tribulations of life. It shows the martyrdom of people like Stephen at the very beginning of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7. It shows you how the different disciples and Christians were persecuted for their faith, how many were put in prison and many died because of faith in Christ. The apostles themselves did not live in a bubble. Of the 12 apostles, as you know, Judas committed suicide. The other 10 were martyred. They were crucified and beaten and stoned to death beheaded, uh, hit with spears, and crucified. Only one lived to a ripe old age, and that is John, and he was put in exile on the island of Patmos, where he writes the book of the Revelation. 
And so God does not promise us a life without troubles. Uh, Another person said this, you will end up really disappointed if you think people will do for you as you have done for them. Not everyone has the same heart as you. We live in a fallen world, a world of trouble and tribulation. There is no bubble for us to live in. We live with everyone else on this fallen planet filled with sin and filled with people who do terrible things. And yet on this planet, we can have hope. We can be like this house here that survived a hurricane. Most of the houses around it were flattened, but it survived the hurricane because of its foundation. It was built deep. It was built well. And that's what God wants for our lives, that we have deep roots in the promises of God, that they anchor us in the storms of life. Reminds me of Eliza May Alcock once said, I'm not afraid of storms. I'm learning to sail my ship. And we sail our ship anchored in the word of God. So let's get into a story about a storm, a story that a lot of you know from Matthew 14. The writer says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And sometimes we create storms because of the dumb things we do. As Forrest Gump said, stupid is as stupid does. David and Bathsheba's a story of stupidity, of David breaking his marriage vows, of David hurting somebody, and the trouble that he got in. As Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And so we need to understand that if we do things that are dumb, storms will come upon us. But these disciples are in a storm because Jesus told them to be there. Matthew 14, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. And some of the storms we get into are not of our own making. They are what God has allowed or living in this fallen world. And here's some interesting facts about this trip that the disciples are on in the Sea of Galilee. They're leaving in the evening. The sun is setting. Jesus is not with them. Jesus is asking them to row three or four miles, about an hour-long trip. But then the storm hits, and they are in that storm all night long. About four or five in the morning, they're still miles from where they're supposed to be. But they are rowing. They are being obedient to Jesus. They're not letting the storm stop them. But I'm sure they had one thought in mind. Can you guess what that thought is? Think about it for a minute. What would you think about in the midst of the storm? They are thinking about, does anyone know where Jesus is? Where is Jesus? He's supposed to be with us. Where is Jesus in the storm? And that's what we also say to ourselves so often. Where is Jesus in the storm that I am in? So where is Jesus? Jesus is in prayer. He's praying for this world, and he's praying for his disciples. Jesus is in prayer. Jesus is interceding for them. And that word interceding is a verb to make specific requests or petitions for someone else. It is used in Acts chapter 25 of a a governor named Festus who intercedes to the king for the apostle Paul. And we are called to be people who, like Jesus, who intercede in prayer for others in their storms. 1 Timothy 2, I exhort therefore, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And so this kind of prayer is very important. And Jesus is showing the importance of intercessory prayer. And I encourage my church elders to pray for me and Pastor Greg, to pray for our congregation, to pray for those who are sick. I want my elders 
to be known for their intercessory prayer. And I want you fathers to pray for your spouses, your brothers and sisters, your children if you have them. You mothers to pray for your spouse, to pray for your kids, aunts, uncles, and to pray for others. I want you children to pray for your parents and grandparents and to pray for your friends. This is to be an important part of our lives, praying for other people. And it reminds me of a story about this king. And this king was having a meeting with his noblemen and advisors and high ministers of state. And suddenly in the midst of the meeting, there was a big bang and a clatter at the door of the throne room. And all the eyes turned to the door of the throne room as it burst open and a young boy came running in. One of the guardsmen stopped the boy and said, hold on there, lad. Don't you know you're disturbing the counsel of the king? And the boy said this, he's your king, but he's my daddy. And he was able to come on up. God wants us to boldly come to his throne room because we are his children and he is our heavenly father. And he wants to hear us intercede for the people around us. And so I pray that this is part of your life. And if you want to be a part of an intercessory prayer team, we have them here at church. Every Monday at 1230, you can gather with other Christ followers and intercede for this congregation and community and this world. We also have a prayer chain where you will get prayer requests to intercede for others. And if you are in the midst of a storm, let others pray for you. This is a missing component for many of you. You get in the storm and think you can make it all by yourself. You need people praying for you. And so call our church office with your prayer requests, big or small, and let us intercede for you. And here's probably the main point of the sermon. Jesus intercedes in prayer for us. Romans 5. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus is praying for you. And let that be an anchor in your storm that Jesus is praying for you and that others want to pray for you also. Max Locato wrote, Jesus, right now, at this moment, in the midst of your storm, is interceding for you. The king of the universe is speaking on your behalf. Jesus is calling out to the heavenly father. Jesus is urging help of the Holy Spirit. You do not have to fight the storm alone. So right now, in your storm, Jesus is praying for you. And does Jesus answer these prayers? Yes, and here's the next part of our text. Shortly before John, Jesus goes out walking on the lake. When his disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Jesus becomes the answer to his own prayer. The disciples are fearful, and Jesus goes to them. Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And that is what we need to understand, that quite often in the midst of our storms and troubles, the answer is Jesus. Seeing Jesus there in our storm, knowing that Jesus is praying for us, knowing that Jesus will be with us in the midst of our storms. And so invite Jesus to be with you in your storms. And how does Jesus visit us? He visits us through other people, his hands and his feet, the church. But most of all, he visits us through his word, the Bible. And I know sometimes we read the Bible and we just don't seem to get anything. But God is there with us as we read his word. And then he is with us in this gift of Holy Communion. And some of you right now need communion. You're at your homes and you need God to come and be with you in a physical way. And that's what communion is. In that bread, 
in that wine, there is Jesus. And if you're afraid of coming to church, I'm not afraid, or Pastor Greg, of coming to your home and giving you communion. We have a way of doing it safely, that we can give you this amazing presence of God. If you live far away from us, I can contact a pastor somewhere near you who will come and give you communion after they instruct you in the Christian faith a little bit. And so invite Jesus to be with you in the storm, in word, in bread and wine. Allow him to be there with you in the midst of the storm. And then to close up today, I think a lot of you know what happened next. Uh, Peter says, Jesus, can I come to you? And Jesus says, come. And Peter steps out of the boat and he starts to walk on water, but then he becomes afraid by the wind and the waves. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches out and catches him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And they climb back into the boat and the wind dies down and the disciples worship Jesus. Truly, you are the son of God. And so that's what our calling is too. In the midst of the storm, we invite Jesus in our presence. We allow him to love us in spite of our little faith. And we worship him as our son of God. And he takes us through the storm. And eventually, whatever storm you're in right now will come to an end. Jesus will get you through the storm. Invite him into your presence. As another author wrote, Right now, in this moment, in the midst of your storm, Jesus is interceding for you. The king of the universe is speaking on your behalf. Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. So Jesus is praying for you. You are called to pray for others and to let others pray for you in the midst of the storm. And so allow Jesus to be there with you. So we're going to watch a little video that we started our sermon series with and let it remind you that Jesus is there in the midst of your storms. I know your story. I've read it cover to cover. And I know the storms that will come. The waves will swell and the sky will darken. Though you'll fight against the current, you'll be swept away. You'll feel helpless and abandoned, and you'll wonder where I am in the midst of it all. I know this isn't the way you thought our relationship would work, but my plans are not for my comfort or yours. My purposes are always and only an expression of love. The scars in my hands are proof that love will sometimes lead you directly into the storm. Though you can't understand my plans, you can trust in one thing, that I am entirely good. You can't even imagine how good I am, and my plan for you is no different. When you shout asking where I am, know that I am right behind you with my arms wrapped tightly around you, whispering, I will never let go. For you are the pinnacle of my creation and the center of my affection. There will come a day when I will quiet every storm and wipe away every tear. In that day, there will be no more pain or death. But until that day comes, I will be your anchor in this storm. We now continue our time of worship with our time of prayer. And again, I encourage you to stand for this time before our God. We pray, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are interceding for us right now, that you are taking our worries and concerns to the throne of God, and that we can trust that you are on our side 
and that you are the answer to our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for our country once again and for all those suffering from the COVID virus. We ask your healing upon them, and especially those who work in the White House. We pray for those who are suffering personal injuries from different accidents, those who are suffering from cancer, and especially those who are suffering from depression. Uh, we'd ask that you would come into their lives. We pray, Lord God, that you would be with the police and sheriffs and firemen and first responders in our country. Give them the courage and strength that they need, and also with those who work in local clinics and hospitals. And Lord God, we also pray that you would help us to understand that having you present in our lives is the answer that we need so often. Having you with us in the midst of the storms brings blessings. Be with us this week. Help us to find opportunities to serve other people. And as we serve them, let us share with them the good news of the cross. We ask this in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. A few quick parish announcements. Once again, we want to thank all those who support uh, the work of Mount Calvary with your gifts and offerings. If you'd like to make an offering, you can go online to our church website, mclutheran.com, and that's uh, an easy way to get that done. Also coming up on October 23rd, we have a drive-in movie. It's a Friday night, 7 o'clock. It's the original Jungle Book we'll be playing here. And then on October 31st, we have our drive through trunk or treat event. People drive on up, they stay in their cars, we pass them candy six feet away, and then they go to the next car and get some more candy. And then there'll be some other stops along the way. One about our mission trip to Guatemala, another that presents the gospel message of Jesus to those people in the cars. So October 31st, and that is from 11 to 1 o'clock. And again, if you need somebody to pray with you, make sure you call our church up. We have a large prayer team that would be glad to intercede with you and for you to the throne of God. Well, let us now stand, receive God's blessings as we go forth for another week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his counts upon you and give you peace. Amen. Oh,